Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to this special Express Entry Live Q&A. When I started doing these live streaming on YouTube and Facebook, Express Entry was driving the ship. In fact, it was the thing that I did more often than any. Every noon on Tuesdays, I would do an Express Entry Live Q&A. And, uh, and it's kind of fun to get back to that. So today, remember, the focus of our discussion today is all about Express Entry. So as we're going forward, as we're taking questions, and it's, it's all going to be about questions, anything you want to talk about Express Entry, I will take time to explain, to teach, to show, to demonstrate, but we're going to try to confine it to Express Entry and not let it get too far out to all the other permutations because that's what I do. That's what I do on my Wednesday Canadian Immigration Live Q&As and the other times where I will address topics like spousal sponsorship, which is what I did with Alicia, one of the lawyers in my law firm, today at three. If you missed it, go back and check it out because there's some great information in there. Lots of uh, tips and strategies, and we even had a Q&A session. So head over there and check that out. All right, so we um, <clears throat> we will get to this. We will get to Express Enter. We get to all the Q&As, everything, in just a second. All right, so let's see who's tuning in. I love it to see. I absolutely love to see who's who's tuning in. So we've got Varun is over in Scarborough, and I chose seven for a reason, you guys. I chose seven because it's nine o'clock Eastern, it's seven o'clock Mountain, and it's six o'clock Pacific time. Well, and it's East. Uh, let's see, uh, over in Atlantic. Well, it's it's I think seven ten o'clock. So realistically, it's open season for everybody on a Friday, and because the pandemic is still going, because things are not opened up full bore for everyone. People are going to be at home and hopefully this was a good time to do it. And that's why I decided to do it. And it's interesting. Um, let's see here. I saw one comment. Oh, okay. We've got the Fuhrer who's from Vancouver. That's great. And um, question posting after you say yes. As soon as I give you the green light, then post those questions. We've got Shoab who's there. Um, uh, okay. And there's someone asking questions about <laughs> a bunch of different stuff. And the Fuhrer says, long day today. And yes, it has been a long day. Absolutely it has. But this is what I love to do. I absolutely love to get on here, do live Q&As. I love the interaction. I love sharing. You guys, I think, remember that I, yes, I'm a Canadian immigration lawyer, called to the bar in Alberta, been practicing since basically 2005 is when I was officially called. But I worked as a summer student, an articling student, and I worked on the border in 2002 as an officer. So I've been involved in this since 2002. And uh, that's a big part of who I am. But before I became an immigration lawyer, I was a high school teacher. And in between law school years, when I was going to law school, I worked on the border as an immigration officer. So all of that, I've kind of combined it together to do this. And that's something that I love more than anything. And the technology just... I was riped and primed and just like I was ripe primed, I guess you could say it, to, to do this, but the technology wasn't there. So what did I do? I traveled all over. I spoke at conferences. I presented. I love doing those things. And then Facebook Live came to town. Um, I had a little private Facebook group where I went in and answered all the questions. And that little group, as some of you probably know if you're watching it in the Express Entry Law Group, is over 126,000 people, I think, now. And I'd go in and answer everyone's questions. But it became so big, I realized that I couldn't do that. So now I created the live Q&A. And when Facebook live streaming and then the software I use, Ecamm, uh, came about, wow, it was, it was awesome. So that's how I got started doing what I'm doing. This live Q&A today is all about Express Entry. So try to confine your questions to that. Um, I will say hello to a few more people here. We've got Terry Ann, and then those of you who are posting questions, just hold off, okay? And then we will jump in. As soon as I give you the green light, always make sure you put a Q in front of it because that Q will then tell me that the questions you're asking are specific for me and not just comments in between uh, between people. All right. Now I'm just looking here to see if anyone on Facebook is connected. I don't see too many comments. So if you are watching on Facebook, I love to know whether or not it is actually um, being broadcast to 
the Express Entry Law Group, and to the um, Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page. Sometimes, um, sometimes there's glitches with the software, and it looks, yes, indeed. It looks like uh, I do see Masood is here, and there are some comments coming. Masood's from Dubai. Okay, we're good. All right, good. We've got Cynthia from Toronto. Thank you guys for confirming. Zishan is over in Pakistan. Um, yes, D-World, it is late Atlantic, but you got to do what you got to do. So sometimes I have to pull you guys in a little bit later. And those who are tuning in from all over the world, well, I know in, in India, Pakistan, it's probably like 6.30 in the morning or something. So, uh, But it's Saturday, I think there. I think it's Saturday. So there is trade-offs, but uh, you try to accommodate and make it work for as many as possible. Okay, let's see who else we have here. Excellent. We've got Katan in Wellington, New Zealand. Great. Taha is over in Bahrain. Fantastic. Masood's in Dubai. This is what I love to see. Um, we've got Simran over in Vancouver. Uh, Salman on Facebook. Good to see you. Thanks for confirming. I appreciate that. All right. And uh, and then we've got Patel is over. Uh, yes, I am from YYC. I wonder where you are, Patel. So YYC is the airport code in Calgary, for those of you who don't know. Yes, 607, Zishan. Great to have you, Pakistan. And Ahmed, yo to you from Rabat. Awesome, Pakistan as well. Ali, shout out to you. And Trinidad, let's shout out to everybody. We've got Dwayne who's tuning in. And uh, thanks so much. Um, we've got Three Pos, Singapore, and Halifax, Maria, and Vishal's in Mumbai. So big shout out to everybody who's tuning in. And don't hesitate to let other people know that I'm live right now because I just announced this kind of shortly this afternoon. I wasn't, I, I just decided that I had some time and, and some capacity to, to fit this in. And so Viom and all of the others that have tuned in, I don't hesitate to share it with other people to let them know that we're going live right now in a quite unusual time. So good to see you. Vishal over in India, Samantha's Jamaica, wonderful. I don't know, do we have anyone from Africa? I'm not sure if we've hit that yet. Okay, all right, Patel. Uh, all right, YYC. Uh, Snahal is YYC, Calgary is all uh, as well. Excellent. Okay, now is the time. Couple things, you can go ahead, post your questions. Dave, good to see you over in Guyana. You can start posting your questions now. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to try to enlarge this just a little bit. I'm going to back this one off a bit. And then I'm going to try to enlarge this just a little bit so it's easier to see. And then just center it. Good. Okay. So, yes, make sure you get that question there. I see them starting to come through. That's great. We've got Murgesh over in Ham uh, Hamilton. That's awesome. Good to see you. Okay. I'm going to flip my screen around here. And I am going to... Uh, I'm going to address the elephant in the room. So we're going to start with this one right off the bat. And what is the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room is this right here. Now let's see if I can make sure that this is fitting properly on here. I think uh, we'll stick that right there. Make sure it's sized right. Back it off here a bit. There we go. And then make sure I pull it up so that I can see right there. Excellent. Okay. So this is the elephant in the room, you guys. Express entry, rounds of invitations right here. And if we scroll down and we look, what do we see? We see that the last draw was still September the 1st, 2021, a PNP draw. So what does that mean? If we look at the previous rounds, something has happened. Something has happened. And we have now no draw for the last nine days, which normally that's not a big deal. We don't think too much about it. But the reality is the last CEC draw we had, we're nine days short of a full month. So I so, so the August the 19th was when we um when we last had a CEC draw, which was a modest draw. It was only three thousand. And uh now it's been, we're September the 10th right now, almost we're closing in on a full month with no CEC draw. And of course, all year, you can scroll through all of these uh, rounds of invitations all the way back, go to the next page, all the way back to right before Christmas, December 23rd was the last time we had an FSW draw. Well, a draw that was inclusive of FSWs. So the question, you guys, as we look at this, and I know people are already asking it, 
right here with the ministerial instructions, invitations to apply under the express entry system. As we go through this and we look at uh, this page right here, the question that people are asking with these express entry rounds of invitations, why? Why is this happening? Why are there not draws? Are they going to open it up? What is the factor? What's going on? Now, most of you who are in Canada are well aware of this. Some of you who are outside of Canada may not be paying attention, but here's the reality. So if we go right here, we click on this link right here, and you can see Canada Votes 2021. This is the issue right now. So we are in the midst of a federal election. And it appears, now whether there's a direct impact or otherwise, it appears to me <laughs> that this may be playing a factor in their decision to continue issuing rounds of invitations. And so um, ultimately, uh, the, the, you know, the, the election we know is going to be, is going to be um, held in just a little over a week here. And, um, and then once that election happens, we could have a new minister. We could have a new political party. We could have a minority government, which basically means that the winning party did not get the majority of votes, but they got more votes than anyone else. And that's what we have right now with the liberals. So there could be another liberal minority government. We could have a minority conservative government, or we could have a majority. And that definitely does play a role when, um, you know, with, with immigration policy in Canada. Now, a lot of you, I know you're asking the question, if you haven't posted in the comments already, what will it mean if the conservatives get in and the liberals go out? Because you guys know 401,000 was the big target for for the liberals for immigration and i can tell you that both the the conservatives and the liberals are definitely pro immigration now how where they differ tends to be the difference between economic immigration versus family class or refugee or humanitarian and so the numbers that they really decide how many they're going to bring in that's really what comes you know that's really where the impact will be but one thing we do know is that whether it's liberals or conservatives, they're both very pro-economic immigration. So this is an express entry live Q&A. And I personally do not think there's going, excuse me, there's going to be um, a significant shift depending upon the party that is in power. So that's my thought process. That's kind of where I'm at. And hopefully that makes sense to you guys. All right, let's dive into some of these questions. And remember, I'm going to skip past questions that aren't specifically related to express entry. And we're going to focus just right in on Express Entry because this is the Express Entry, my EE Live Q&A. Okay. Uh, all right. So Nixon starts right off heavy hitting with the documents. What do we need to upload for proof of funds for CEC? Is it okay to leave it blank? Great question. So the question arises in your EAPR, how many family members do you have and how much funds do you have to support them in Canada? And those of you who are in Canada and have that one year and are eligible under the Canadian Experience class, well, you could put zero if you want to. And this is a little pro tip. If you put zero, then there is no box to upload anything. I just did a review today with a client and we put zero in that box for how much funds were available. And there was no spot to upload anything for proof of funds because if you're drawn under the Canadian Experience class or you have a job offer, an offer of employment, you do not need to provide proof of funds. So what do you need to upload for CEC? If you put zero in how much funds you have available, then no box will open up in your personal document checklist. If you put anything in there, $1, then it will open up a spot. And the guidance that we've always received from immigration is that you put in a simple letter of explanation, a one pager that says, Please note, I've been drawn under the Canadian Experience class, and therefore I do not need to provide proof of settlement funds, period. There you go. Great question, Nixon. Big round of applause to Nixon for starting us off with an excellent question. Really, really good. Okay, and then at the end of this video, um, we're going to have a little bit of fun. The person, and I'm keeping notes here, the person who asks the best question of the evening at the end with about five minutes to go, I'm going to give them the opportunity to join me live at the end of this Q&A. 
I'm going to pull them in as a guest and we're going to give them a shout out. We're going to find out where they're living, what stage of the express entry process they're at, and just give them a chance to say hello to everybody else because this is indeed live. Of course it is. But the top question and uh, that question, the winner is going to be pulled in if they wish to into the live stream with me. And I have the ability to pull you in. And so I'll keep you posted in a second about that. So stick with us. If you got a good question, stick with us. And um, and you may very well find yourself as my guest right here on this special edition of the Express Entry Live Q&A. All right, let's keep zipping through here. Let's see what's next. Okay, let's, and uh, no holds barred, we'll open it up. So Vishvesh says, when I evaluated myself for EE, CEC, the Canadian Experience class, and my CRS was 468. When I submitted my file, it showed not eligible and score showed was zero. What shall I do? It happened two times. Well, this is the this is the challenge, Vishvesh. There could be any number of things that you put in there um, that potentially could have disqualified you and made you ineligible. So let's have some fun, okay? Let's have some fun. This is what this is all about. So we're going to go over here and I'm going to go to CRS. Actually, I'm going to go here to um, come to Canada tool. <laughs> this one I have not used for a long time. But those of you who are trying to determine your eligibility, this is where we start. And so I know for you, Vishvesh, you said that when you were calculating your, your CRS score, you figured it was 468. But when you submitted your file, it showed as not eligible. So I'm assuming that was in your profile. So let's just take a look here at this little tool that the government has created to help people determine if they're eligible for really express entry. So if we go here, check eligibility, we're going to go through this really fast. Okay, do you know which problem you're, province you're going to go to? Uh, I don't care. I just put Alberta and let's click on next here. Okay, then it says we need your language test. So this is one of the areas that you could have a problem, Vishvesh. So you have to make sure that your language test results, and I just pick IELTS here, you have to pick the date. And if the date is over two years old, if I put 2019, January the 1st, and I put that's the date I took my test, and I click next, look what it says here. It says, you have not completed the mandatory fields. Your test results must be at least two years old when you apply. Please modify your answer. So obviously, I... I don't, I have to assume that your express entry, your test hasn't rolled over, but let's put this back in here. We'll put it 2021 and then I'll advance it. Okay. Then it asks for the scores. Well, of course there's minimum levels that you have to meet, um, for, uh, for IELTS. Essentially, if you're going with a skill level zero or a skill level A, and you're going through the Canadian experience class, you have to have at least a CLB seven. If you are going through as a knock B, then it's just a CLB five. It's quite low. But you guys know there's a big difference between eligibility and actually getting an ITA. So we'll just say that you have the magical CLB9. So speaking, we'll say seven. Listening, it has to be eight. And then reading and writing are both seven and seven. So we'll put that in and we'll go next. And then do you have any other language tests? We'll just say, nope, we don't have any. And we'll go next here. Okay. In the last three years, how many skilled years of skilled work experience do you have in Canada? So Vishvesh, you're going with CEC. So if you want to go through in Canada, the Canadian experience class, you have to have at least one year or more. So when you click on that, then it asks, what level are you? And why is that important? Because if I put here that my language scores were only at a CLB five level, um, so I was scoring fives on my IELTS exam and I said I was working in a skill level A or an O position, it would say I'm ineligible. So we'll just say B and we'll just leave it at that. Okay, and you can see right like that, those are really the only factors when it comes to the base eligibility um, for the purposes of the Canadian Experience class. So ultimately to be eligible in the pool, to submit your application in the pool, those are the only things that we're looking at when it comes to the Canadian Experience class, which is what you're targeting here, Vishvesh. So aside from that, what are some other areas where things could fall off the rails? Well, if you're submitting your profile and it's showing you as not eligible, it usually, it has to relate to one of those factors. So you either didn't put in one year of, of Canadian work experience um, or you uh, your language test results are over two years. Those are the typical things uh, that I see happening. But Vishvesh, 
<laughs> you're going through express entry. And I think many of you by now probably are aware um, that um, that the uh, the that I, as a Canadian immigration lawyer, have a law firm and I have uh, one of the things that I do more than anything else is this. People that come, and I'm going to shrink this one down a bit. Shrink, shrink there. Um, people can go to the, my website, click even in the links below in the description. You can book a consult and I can walk through all that stuff with you, Vishvesh, if you need. But also I want to let you guys know um, that on Monday, and I think we talked about this before, if, if you're not aware, you go to the Canadian Immigration Institute, the TR to PR pathway is still open, express entry, launches September the 13th and you can go right into that link and it will take you right here where you can uh, register right now for the course and, and join all of us. We have a private um, Facebook group right here. I just went live right before we started. This is a private Facebook Facebook group just for the people who subscribe to the course and every evening at 5 p.m. we have our own special live Q&A where we answer every question. So Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Mountain Time, we have our live Q&A in this group for those who subscribe to the course. And the people also have access to everything for life, all of the courses, all the modules, everything. Okay, so all you need to do is go here, click on the link, register now, and come and join us. All right, so, and these types of questions that you have, Vishvesh, <clears throat> they're always a little bit troubling because you must have keyed something in improperly. Um, and that's all I can say. Okay, let's see who's next here. Next, we have uh, TL here. Do I need to tell IRCC that I got <coughs> that I got promoted? <coughs> I'm gonna get a little drink here. My throat's dry now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do I need to uh, do I need to tell IRCC that I got promoted after submitting my documents? Uh, same knock though. Do I need to keep them updated about things? You do need to keep them updated about some things. But when it comes to that, you don't need to notify them that you have been promoted in your position. The reality is, um, unless your position is supported by a job offer, then that makes a difference. And you would have to update them if somehow that affected the nature of your job offer. Because remember, that job offer, yes, and you've indicated you've got the same knock. But if there is a substantive change that could impact on that um, your eligibility for those extra 50 points, if it's a job offer, then yes. But otherwise, I don't notify them. Um, there's, there's nothing gained or added by updating them about changes or promotions in work, okay? Everything is locked in for work at the time in which you get your ITA. Okay, let's see here. Masood, oh, you, Masood, you slipped in a question that wasn't express entry related. Okay, ah. Uh, Okay, all right. I'll answer this one, but you guys have been warned. <laughs> okay, Arrive can ask to provide quarantine plan even for those who are exempt due to being fully vaccinated. How to go around this? Guys, the quarantine plan is like, it basically asks you a couple little questions. The key is that you're indicating that you are exempt and then you're uploading your vaccination records. And when you do that, even the quarantine plan that says, do you have one? Do you have a place to stay? There's just a few little questions in there and it's it's really not a comprehensive requirement. When you get to the border, the officers will want to see the ArriveCan app. They'll want to see the code that's generated there. They will punch that code in or scan it, whatever they do, and then they it'll pull up your information on their screen and um, you will have your, your proof of, of vaccinations that you will have uploaded already and then the officer will make a determination um, as to whether or not they require you to actually take a, a COVID test on arrival. Not always. They, they have discretion as to who they ask and who they don't. But no, I wouldn't worry at all about the quarantine plan other than answering the questions that are in the actual app. All right. Uh, I just flew back to Canada recently. So yes, we went through that. Okay, let's focus on express entry. Please throw some light on the applications from EE uh, with status RFV. Okay, good question, Vishal. I can't throw any light on that, my friend. I can't. Um, lots of people are really upset with me when I tell them that applications are being processed slowly for outland applicants. And some people say, no, they're not. Nothing is happening. Well, that's simply not the case. <clears throat> Individuals are getting confirmations of permanent residence. But some countries are dead dead stop. They are. So Vishal, unfortunately, I can't really said, shed any light because even people 
the, everybody that has RFV as their status, there are individual circumstances that can play into all of the processing. And depending on the country you come from, the visa office, you know, are you inside Canada, outside Canada? There's a whole bunch of different factors. So unfortunately, I can't shed any light on, on those with the, the RFV status. All right. Um, okay, here's one. Anush, and this is something that I cover in my course in great detail, actually. So uh, Anush says, and actually maybe I may just stretch this out a little bit here. And I'm going to shrink this down a little bit. It's a little bit smaller, but then it's not covering my whole ugly melon here. Shrink this down here. Oh, that's kind of small, isn't it, you guys? I want to try to get it just about right. And then we can enlarge that a little bit there. Okay, that's better. We'll do a little bit wider there. Okay, so then it's not me peeking over the top of this comment. All right, so for, for CEC work experience, how many pay stubs should we attach for CEC Express Entry? What other documents should we attach to proof uh, work experience for Express Entry Inland? Great question. Okay, and this is something, like I said, that I cover in detail in my course. The um, When it comes to immigration, uh, I have a client who's still pending and they still have not made a decision. They're just sitting on it. I don't know what they're doing. Um, but uh, basically, when they wanted proof of work experience, the only thing that they asked for immigration were the first two pay slips for the period that they were curious about. So the original pay slips from when the work started, at least the period that that the client was was claiming. Now, I'm not going to get into the the whole issue of this poor client, he had used um, an immigration consultant originally, and the consultant had not taken time to do things properly. And then very sadly, the consultant passed away. And so then he asked if I would take it over. And when I took it over, then I discovered all these issues. And we are fighting to try to save his application right now. But with all of that being said, when it came time for proving via pay stubs, they just wanted the first ones for the period of time that they were curious about. But my position is, just to be thorough, immigration doesn't need every pay slip for every single month that you've been working unless there's other reasons for them to doubt if your work history is actually legit. So if things are pretty straightforward and you just want to shore things up, then I always include at least three from the beginning. And then if, you've, if you're claiming multiple years, like three years, then sometimes I'll put maybe one at the beginning in the end of that second year, and then three at the very end, right before you file your application, if that's work history that's current. If it's older work history, then beginning and end is usually enough, and I don't worry about in between. So there's lots of ways to do this. There is no one right way or wrong way. Um, if things are pretty straightforward and there's no issues, then I almost always advise my clients that they don't need to provide one for every pay period. Heck, some people actually take their, um, they get pay slips every two weeks. And that would be a nightmare, providing 36 times two if you're including it for three full years. That's just overkill, all right? And then in the course, I also talk a lot about um, um, <clears throat> how you structure your letters of explanation for your records of employment. And when you do it correctly, wow, it's just like pfft, the officer breezes through it. And I've never had an issue ever with immigration coming back and having questions about the work history uh, for my clients <clears throat> who hire me for the uh, collaborative review or for those that have taken the course and followed the templates and instructions that I give for the letters of explanation. All right, let's see what we have next. Ah, this is a tough one, Teha. Okay, he says, how long does it take for background checks to be done after biometrics for an application online work permit from Bahrain? That, my friend, I cannot answer that either. Understand that it's hard to tell exactly where the background checks start, at least at what time within the whole processing window, because sometimes, especially during the pandemic, um, processing times are completely out the door. It's really, really difficult to have any expectation or to know um, because things have been stalled out for so long. And especially where they only processed essential or critical work permits, now that they're open things up, um, the background checks and things that they do, um, uh, they're, they're, it's hard to tell how much of your entire processing window is just background checks. And so unfortunately, um, that's not something I'm going to be able to answer. Uh, Teha, you're, you're just kind of in a waiting window, my friend. 
Okay, let's see here. George! Ha ha! I'm going to flip over here. I think you guys have seen George quite a bit. If you go to the Express Entry course and you go down here, you'll see that my good friend George right here is a past subscriber right here to the Express Entry step-by-step uh, -step course. So George, good to see you, my friend. Okay, let's see what you got to say. I would like to confirm if medicals expire while waiting for CECN lands. Do they ask for a new medical? Thanks, George. That's a fantastic question. And do you know what? I'll be honest. Uh, the, the, the message that we've received, at least lately, is that if you are in Canada already, it's very, very unlikely that they're going to require you to get a new medical, my friend. So it's always possible, but what we've seen repeatedly is that they are waiving the medicals. Now, if you're outside of Canada, that's a different story. So I know you're sitting in that queue just waiting for it to be finalized, George. I can't remember which one you were in. I know it was earlier in the year. So you're just in that sweet spot, my friend. You are close, George. Any day now, any day, and you better let me know when you get that approval. So George took the took the course, and um, George is a client, and and it's great great to uh, to see you jumping on, uh, getting more questions answered, my friend. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, this is a good question. Okay, so Mahmoud says, "Hey, Mark, I work at a hotel." Can I get a reference letter from my general manager instead of the hotel owner because general manager hired me, not the owner? Of course you can, my friend. So this is where I love to go here, and I haven't done this for a long time. Let's go here, and we're going to go to the IRCC, and obviously everything is laid out very simply in, in my course, but let's go to some of the source documents. One of them is the Express Entry Completeness Check, and when we go here and we search for reference, it'll pull it up really quick. Let's go right here, there. Okay, so this is proving proof of work experience. And this, um, and those of you who are, are wondering what this is about, you know, it's this applications for permanent resident subject to the express entry completeness check. These are the policies that officers rely upon when they are assessing whether or not an express entry application is complete. So if you look here for proof of work experience, the question is who needs to sign the letter? If you go down here, you can see this is a mandatory for each work experience. Let's close that off. You can see a reference letter from the employer. And then it talks about it should be an official document printed on company letterhead, must include your name, the company's contact information, and they list address, telephone number, email address. What if one of these is missing? Well, I wouldn't worry too much about it if it is um, if the company is easily verifiable. Um, you definitely want to have a form of contact. If you don't have an email address, it's it's probably not the end of the world. But I always try to get every single thing that they're asking for and make sure it's in the letter. Okay, so then you can see right here, what is it asking for? The name, title, and signature of, moment of truth, immediate supervisor, or even personnel officer at the company. So your question here was, what can I get it from the general manager instead of the hotel owner? Well, the reality is your immediate supervisor is totally fine. So there's no problems with that at all. Really, you want the letter from someone who knows and has experience and knowledge of exactly what you were doing. And now sometimes the HR managers, the personnel managers or a personnel officer um, will, um, sometimes they'll be the one signing the letter. But uh, at the end of the day, you're not locked in, my friend, to just the owner of the company. Great question. Um, okay, Samantha says, are you aware of Outlanders getting passport requests. Okay. So Samantha, I know this is a question that I'm getting a, from a ton of people. And um, at this stage, I haven't had anyone that's booked a consult with me, but I am in meetings with immigration. So I think a lot of you are probably aware of the fact that, um, well, I'll just show you guys. And this is the only thing that I can do. Um, uh, national executive. Okay. So we'll do this and we'll pull this up. This is probably the best thing. Okay. So as of September the 1st, I dropped off as the national chair. And so now Kyle, this is just low, slow loading. So now Kyle's taken over. Great lawyer, Kyle. Exceptional. He's now the chair. And then Lisa is now the vice chair. Wonderful person. Robert's just joined us as the secretary of communications. And now I am the immediate past chair. So I worked my way through all the table officer positions and now I am the immediate past chair. Well, I can tell you guys that we have had numerous discussions with immigration. In fact, let's see, when is my next meeting with them? Let me just take a peek. I know what's coming up right away. And the next meeting that I have with immigration is on Tuesday. It's at Tuesday at 1230. So uh, we have an opportunity to ask a bunch of questions. 
to each of the, the, the heads of the departments of immigration, um, you know, permanent residents, temporary residents, refugee asylum. Um, uh, there's even CBSA attend sometimes. And we, sometimes we get ESDC, which are the temporary foreign worker program. And so we have a bunch of questions and then it's an opportunity for us in a team's call to represent our organizations, the Canadian Bar Association, the immigration consultants have their representation and the Quebec lawyers have theirs. And so we attend these meetings and these questions come up. So am I personally aware of outlanders getting passport requests? Well, when you say, do I have a client? Uh, no, I've never had a client who has been outside of Canada who's received their passport request um, in, in the last, I guess, month or two months. But I can tell you, one of our clients from Australia did just come in and land the end of June. And uh, he was held up and then there was an opportunity for him to travel. And actually, do you know what? He may have even come in in July. I'm trying to remember. But it was just under uh, when they opened it up for people that had confirmations of permanent residence. Um, he did come from Australia and land. And I think it was in July, right after those rules opened up. So personally, yes. But even aside from that one isolated client, and, and um, <clears throat> I can tell you that in all of the meetings that we discuss with immigration, they've confirmed repeatedly that they have not stopped all processing of outland applications. In fact, if that was the case, why would they have um, uh, expanded the travel restrictions back in July to people with valid confirmations of permanent residence? So the short answer is yes, I'm aware of outlanders. The long answer is is that I learned that from a client from IRCC in my meetings with them. Um, but yes, it is going slow. And in some countries, it has ground to a halt. All right. Okay, let's see here. Um, and make sure you don't spam, okay, guys? Don't put in multiple multiple questions. And we'll do our very best to get to everybody here. Um, ha. Okay, Sedan says, how to know that we have selected the correct knock code for our express entry application, or you could say, what is the best method to select the NOT code? Oh, Sedan, this is a fantastic lead in. Well, that was fun. <laughs> Let me show you this. Let's flip over here. I'm gonna go to this page right here. I'm gonna log in as a person who's taking our brand new course, and I'm gonna show you something. So NOT codes are something that I've spent a lot of time with. This is the course for the last one that I did in June. But I want to show you something. So there are over 56 lessons. And some the, the, the module six, Mastering Your Documents, is the one that I love the absolute best. In here, within the Record of Employment section, I have something that I call my Knock Selection Tool template. And so this Knock Selection Tool template, I have a sample. I can probably pull this up right here and show you guys because I'm a sharing individual. So I have this little tool that I help people to sort out exactly whether or not they have got their right knock code. And so within here, I help them, I demonstrate how to, um, how to represent your knock to an officer in a way that helps them to agree with you that you have chosen the right knock code. And if you have a bunch of no's on here, in other words, matching of duties in your reference letter to matching the actual um, not code duties, I break it down and go through and create a, a nice table for the officer and I explain to them exactly how and why I think the not code I've chosen is correct. But it's all you guys about matching. It's all about showing, literally demonstrating and making it as easy as possible for the officer that the duties in your letter match with a substantial number of the duties in the not code you've chosen. Let me share something with you here, okay? Now, I guess I could, I wonder if there's a, I don't know if I have any nice music. Let's see. Nope, that's not it. That's not it. Come on, I need some nice music for this. Let's see. I don't think I even have some nice music. I used to, but I don't think I have it anymore. Background. No, that's not it. That's not it. <laughs> I don't have it anymore. I don't know where it is. I had some really good music and now apparently I have lost it. So sad. Let's see. Oh, yes. There we go. Let's use this. Okay. So I'm going to play this and hopefully um, Google won't shut this one down. I'm crossing my fingers. Yeah, I'm going to turn this sound effect down. Okay. Here's what I want you to picture. 
I want you to picture an immigration officer sitting in her home in this corner tight cramped office. And she's been forced to work there because of social distancing. She has her little tiny laptop opened up in front of her and she is trying to work through all of these documents with only a tiny little screen. And it has been a long day. And she has been working hard because she's got quotas. She has to pump through all those 27,323, 33 applications that were submitted back on, you know, with the February 13th draw. And so she's got all of these things all piled up. And now she has to look at this letter that's in one file, close that letter, open up the knock, actual knock in another window and try to match these duties and terminologies and, and, and um, you know, complicated language from an employer letter that's maybe IT related. She has to try to match those up with the more uh, another technical description in the knock. And she's had a long day and she's struggling to match it up. And she says, you know what? I can't figure this out. I don't think it's a match. Refuse. Then she gets yours. And guess what you have? You have Mark's knock selection tool tool here that has helped you to put your duties in place to lay them out for the officer so that when she gets your file, she looks at it. One, she sees how it's all laid out because I've taught you how to do it. And she sees this and she's like, wow, oh, look at this. They've actually made my job easy. Match, match. Yep, I'm not questioning that. They've laid it out very well for me. Approve. And that officer sits back, (sighs) takes a little breath because you've just helped them to catch up because they were behind processing applications. And they say, wow, that was the best application that I have approved all day. Bang. (laughs) And so (laughs) you can see that if you structure things in a way that the officers like to get and like to see, then you're going to have a far greater chance of getting your NOC code correct. And let's face it, sometimes when we're talking about these NOC codes, sometimes it just really struggles to fit, but it has to be one. And so you do the best that you can to match it up with the best one that you could find. And then the knock selection tool I provide gives you the resources to be able to um, demonstrate it to an officer to persuade them that you have got the right one. And after you've done the knock tool, trust me, you're going to have selected the knock that's as close as you could possibly get. All right. So there you go, Sadanth. That's the answer I have for that, my friend. And I just want to say one more time if you come over here, and I'm going to backtrack this right to here. There are in my course, and you can click on the link to register. I have over 56 individual lessons full of templates, sample documents. I have over 50, 25 is it, or 30 reference letters, I think alone is examples that you can work off of. So all of that's in the course. And remember, it starts on Monday. Okay, let's keep zipping down here. Um, okay. Uh, Seton says, can I travel outside of Canada with a COPER? I have valid visa. Can I travel outside of Canada with a confirmation of permanent residence? I have a valid visa. That's really, I don't know what you're referring to, Seton, here, because you should have landed in Canada. So I'm not sure if you mean like traveling from countries that are outside of Canada from place to place. You can travel wherever you want there. If you haven't landed in Canada, you can do whatever you want. And then when you come to Canada, you complete the landing. And obviously, you've just said right there that you've got a COPER and you've got a valid visa. So um, if you're coming from a country where the travel restrictions limit it, then I would really encourage you to be cautious if you decide to try to go through some third country to get to Canada because if there are are planes or travels that are restricting travel. Okay. Um, Okay. D World says, can we enter the pool after 10 months? IRCC FAQ said, no. If we do, would that be misrepresentation? Okay, so what D World is talking about here, something that I also cover in my course. Who am I kidding? Like the reality is, I don't think there's much that I don't cover in the course. But what he's getting at is the fact that there are, um, uh, when you're entering your work history, they count it by month. So if you say you started work on October the 31st, they will give you credit for the entire month of October. And then if you say your work ended on September the 1st of the next year, they will give you credit for the entire month of September. What does that mean? You've worked two days more than 10 months, but they've given you credit for 12 months. So 
Here is the answer. Lots of direction they give on the website that is immigration policy. And it's not law, but it's their directives and it's how they've instructed their officers to interpret it. Well, you have no control over the profile. So if you enter your, your work history as starting in October of last year, and now you've indicated that you've reached September of this year, well, it's going to allow you into the pool. Is that some, some form of misrepresentation? It's impossible. It's not possible to be misrepresentation if you're actually answering the question truthfully month by month. But here is the kicker. If you get your ITA, I would never, ever submit my EAPR unless I had waited until I'd fully achieved the full 12 months of work history. And in fact, in those meetings, the one I'm telling you that I'm, I have next Tuesday, this Tuesday coming up with IRCC, we've asked that specific question. And they've repeatedly told us that if an individual waits till they get their EAPR, um, <coughs> waits to file their EAPR until they've actually met the full 48 months or 12, 24 months, uh, who am I kidding? Boy, it's already getting late. <laughs> 12 months, 1,560 hours is what I'm trying to say. If you've met that full 12 month period, by the time you submit your EAPR, then obviously officers can make whatever decisions they want. But excuse me, I've never ever heard of an officer rejecting an application in those circumstances. Okay, so good question. And I think D World, if I go up to the front, I think I'm trying to remember here. I think that question might have been asked. Um, maybe it was asked earlier in another live that I did. Maybe it was a question that was asked on Wednesday. Okay, let's see what else we have going on here. I got to get back to my spot. Uh, <laughs> I scrolled down a little bit and now I have lost my place. Um, let's see here. Ha <laughs> I don't want to miss anyone's. Okay. <laughs> Himan says, can you do a live on effective election on immigration? You know what? That's a great idea. And I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to give you a, oh, do you know what? That was, a, I'm going to turn the sound effect up a little bit here and I'm going to do that again. That was a pretty good question. See, it's not just, well, we'll see. I'm going to, I think, I think Iman here has uh, potentially, <laughs> has potentially earned a one vote for best question of the evening. So let's see. That's a good question. I think I will do that because I think it would be very, very worthwhile, but I will do it on my immigration nation. So I think those of you who are watching on YouTube, I think you guys know that I have here, let's flip this over my channel. And you'll see, I think here, that in my playlist, I have a playlist for immigration nation. So if you go to Immigration Nation, you'll see even the one that I did just today with, with Alicia, but I bring another lawyer in to talk about a bunch of things. So this was awesome. This was, uh, Will Tao knocked it out of the park, but you can see there's a ton of these where I invite guests on from other uh, locations to join me in my Immigration Nation. And so um, I'm going to invite someone on. Maybe I'll see if Richard Curlin will come in and join me. He's a good, he's a good, uh, a, a good person to have. Let's see, when was it? Oh, I just did Richard, the future of immigration processing. I did him just a little while ago. Okay, anyways, back to <laughs> back to the discussion. So I'm definitely going to do that one. Okay, uh, good to see you. Uh, Seedon is over in Vancouver. Sam is on Facebook. Great. Um, okay, Zia says, why is immigration not processing a lot of inland CECs? Many people are waiting for it for almost 20 months. Well, the irony of that situation is, we're getting applications approved in as little as months. So if there are delays, it's largely as a result of background checks or you have an overseas dependent. So people that have overseas dependents under CEC are by and large the ones that have been waiting. But my friend, Zia, if you've been waiting for almost 20 months, I'm going to ring that bell. I'm going to tell you, if you're not otherwise represented, if you are, if you do have a representative, then they should be inquiring on your behalf. Because a CEC application, if you've been in Canada and you, all your dependents are here, there should be no reason why that Canadian Experience Class application is still pending for almost 20 months, unless there's something else with the background security screening that is not cleared. Okay, 
All right, so I'm going to jump ahead now because I can see I actually backtracked. Um, okay, now we're moving forward to where I was at. Um, I, asked, I answered a lot of questions here. <laughs> okay. Okay, we got that. Uh, okay, there we go, finally. <laughs> um, okay, now I think we're at... Okay, okay. here's Kutan says. Oh, this is a great one. Are there any priorities given to occupations when FSW pool selections are done? I work as an immigration officer, and I'm sure IRC would need more officers to clear the queue. <laughs> Kutan, who knows? I'm sure they do need more officers. Absolutely. The question is, do they have money to hire more officers? I know that in the last budget, they kicked over a lot of money to building out a new um, a new immigration online filing system, which absolutely is critical. Um, but okay, so when it comes to FSW, some of you may have watched YouTube videos or live streams with people who got this magical document that suggested that knock codes might be uh, in play when it comes to the Federal Skilled Worker Program opening up. Well, it's entirely possible that that is the direction that it could go because I've seen it myself. I've, I've In fact, um, those exact discussions were had with Minister Mendicino. And so... Without a doubt, that is probably a direction that they're going to go. If we flip over here and go back to the rounds of invitations and the fact that we have not had a round of invitation since September the 1st, it could very well be that the Liberal government and the Liberal Minister of Immigration, Marco Minicino, could be ready to make a big splash <laughs> right before the election, right before people vote. Maybe that's what they're waiting for, about a brand new program to encourage economic growth in Canada. That's entirely possible. So we'll have to see how it plays out, but that's a good question. And uh, when it comes to priorities right now, we don't see anything, uh, Katan. So none of that is a part of express entry at this stage. Could it be in the future? Maybe. And there's even dollars attributed to this in the last budget to in implement this within express entry, but it hasn't been launched yet. Trust me, the, moments it's, the moment it's launched, I will be doing a live stream explaining all about it. But I don't like to speculate because I can't tell you how many times I've seen in the last 15, 16, however many years I've been practicing, um, how many times the government has intended to roll something out and it just never got rolled out. Maybe there's a, with, uh, maybe there's a government change and the new party decides that they're not going to proceed forward with that liberal plan. They're going to create their own. I've seen that happen enough. Okay. Um, Okay, do you think Express Entry will reopen in 2023, hoping my one-year postgrad will be enough for 22-23? Of course, it's not going anywhere. It might be tweaked or adjusted, but this is a very, very popular program. All the parties love it. They think it's very, very useful. It's, it's designed to get permanent residence very quickly for people, aside from the pandemic, and it's good for Canada and our long-term immigration policy and uh, our, our, our long-term economic recovery plan. We see immigrants being a big part of it. So no, I don't see any issues with 2023. Um, you are going to have options. They're just not going to get rid of it. It's one of the, the most popular programs in the world, um, one of the most well-respected programs in the world. Okay, all right. So focusing, 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 focusing on express entry, guys. Um, okay, so let's see here. Okay, Patel says, can we create our express entry profile before one or 1.5 months for CEC category? Thank you in advance. I answered that one, Patel. Okay, we've got Swipe over in Manchester, UK. Hello. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I wasn't going to answer this, but technically it kind of relates a little bit. Um, I personally don't think the TR to PR pathway is going to be resurrected in the form that it is right now. I think it was a one-time humanitarian application designed to reward essential workers and students that really suffered because of the pandemic and the closures across the country. Okay, let's see what's next. Um, okay, and remember guys, I'm focusing on express entry. Yeah, so Vicky, I think we talked about that one. FSW applications, I know people have been waiting forever. It's so, so hard to watch it. And um, I know that you're waiting for a year still. Background check hasn't started. Vicky, can you imagine the people 
who were 29 years old last year, who are sitting at maybe, let's say, 472 points, and now they're closing in on a birthday, and they know that the rounds of invitations are going to be high, and if it passes over their 30th birthday, they're going to lose five points, drop them down to 467. The, the no, speci- no specific, um, uh, no specified program draws, the open FSW draws, haven't gone down that low, like in as long as I can remember, a long, long time. In fact, 468 was as low as it had gone for over a year. And that was at the end of the year when they did back to back to back 5,000 cohort draws. So Vicky, I, my heart goes out for you for being stalled out, but at least you're in, right? At least you're in. There's so many sitting in the pool who are seeing their, their opportunity slip away just because of the pandemic and no fault of their own. Um, no, Kishan says, will the election affect applications already submitted? No, it will not. It will not. Those will be processed business as usual. And if it did, then you'd contact me and you would be a part of a class action lawsuit. Okay. I keep dropping down here. I'm going to sit a little bit higher. Every time I go to talk, I kind of drop down. It's been such a long day there. I'm going to sit a little bit higher. So I'm not like crunching down here trying to talk to you guys. Huh, the joys of being a one man show doing everything here. Okay. Let's keep answering some more questions here. I know we're closing in on an hour, but let's see what we can do. Um, Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. Let's see. Iman says, um, hi, Mark. I have an LMIA. I love how you guys call them Lima. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Someone like had, uh, they got the acronym wrong, but they're labor market impact assessments. So they're LMIA. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that Lima. Uh, based PR application submitted for six months now. What will happen to a PR application if I leave for work outside Canada? If you have a job offer supporting that, uh, it depends on, and this is something I'm going to ring the bell because Iman, it depends upon the nature of that job offer. If you leave and you're no longer working and it was a part of a, um, uh, like the job offer um, uh, is linked to an LMIA and a work permit that you currently have, that can be a problem, right? And so um, generally speaking, that's something I would strongly, strongly advise against, especially given the fact, and I'm assuming you're talking about express entry here, Um now, it's possible, I guess, you have a, an LMIA that's based, um, it's a permanent LMIA that's to support your application if you're outside of Canada. But if you are inside Canada and I, and you're, well, I, I guess, of course you are if you're leaving for work outside, I would highly advise you not to do that. It does expose you to losing those 50 points. And if you lose those 50 points and it drops below the round of invitation level, then you could have your whole application unraveled. Now, there may be other factors that maybe it wouldn't, affect it or wouldn't impact it. But really, I need to look at your situation in detail. So I recommend you book a consult. Okay. Uh, Oh, my goodness. Okay, Jenny. Yes, I've seen this so many times repeatedly over and over. So eCoper received but haven't got anything for dependents. Since there is not more border lock, why lives are still on hold? Because in countries abroad, their offices are not operating at full capacity. And your dependents, unlike you, who can benefit from an e-coper, need at this stage anyways, unless there's some policy shift or, or regulatory changes um, that amend the need for a visa being imprinted in a passport, unless that changes and they say, okay, we're going to go e-copers for everyone, that's what's slowing it down. So visa offices are not operating at full capacity. And so people are stuck in the situation where... Um, If there's only a skeleton crew working in the visa offices, they're not going to be able to process the volume of applications that normally they would. And that's why things are going so slow. My heart goes out to you, my friend. Oh, it just, it really, really does. People are really struggling and it's, this pandemic has just been cruel. I'll be honest, really, really cruel. And the world has has chosen to, you know, to do what it can to try to curb, um, curb the spike, curb the, curb the wave and, um, you know, as individuals, we, we, you know, we respect our government's decisions and we do what we can to, to, uh, to follow along and be good, you know, good citizens. Um, but no one is taking away the fact that it's caused so much harm to people. Um, okay, Sean, Sean says, should one declare uh, a moving violation conviction in the U.S., which is not either a felony or misdemeanor as a conviction of a criminal offense? 
as a border officer, I dealt with U.S. convictions all the time with people in admissibility to Canada and problems with wanting to come up and travel, but they couldn't because they had a DUI or something more serious. No, speeding tickets are not something that you have to declare because they are not an offense that would equate to uh, a conviction under an act of parliament in Canada. And what is an act of parliament in Canada? It's like the criminal code, a criminal offense. Um, it's like the, uh, the our drug act. Um, but traffic tickets are administered provincially and municipally, provincially. Yeah, provincially. And so you're, uh, you don't have an obligation if it was truly just a speeding ticket. Okay, good question. I like that one. Um, Okay, here's a good one. How long, and once again, guys, each of these questions and so much more are covered in the course. And so I would strongly encourage you guys to get over there and take it. And anything else that you have that is not answered in the videos, bring it to the evening evening Q&As or post it in the Facebook group and every question will get answered. And so I can tell you, I'm driving the ship. It's me. It's like me representing, you know, 20, 30, however many, 40 people who register all at once. And you guys all benefit from each other's questions too. That's why I love it so much. Because when people ask one question, someone might think, oh, that's a dumb question. I'm not going to ask that. And then someone will ask it and they're like, oh, I'm glad they did. Or someone will ask a question that people never even thought of. And they're like, oh my goodness, I could have made that mistake. I didn't even know it was a problem. And that's the kicker, you guys. Because often you don't know what you don't know. And how do I know that you don't know what you don't know? Because of the consultations that I have all the time with people who've had their applications refused because they thought they got it all right. And it's a landmine waiting to explode. That's express entry. Okay, how long should my reference letter I get from my previous company prior uploading post ITA? If, you're, if it's a previous company and you have not worked there, they don't really expire as long as the contact information in the letter is still current. The person signing it, their contact information, uh, you know, the company still exists. As as long as those things are all current, there is no expiry. So the moment I know I'm going through express entry, the moment I know I'm going to be close to, to maybe getting an ITA, well, I've got those reference letters in advance. And I have no problem submitting a reference letter that's two years old, three years old. Doesn't matter to me if it was for work history in the past with an old employer and that employer has given you a letter that is still current. So all the contact information, the people, the emails are all all current. Great question. I like that one. That was a good one as well. Okay, I'm going to put that one on the list here. Let's see. So we've got Dran, Dran Reb. Interesting name, Dran Reb. Okay, you have, <laughs> you've, that's a good question. Lots of people, lots of people are going to benefit from that one. And that's why I love them. Okay. Um, okay. Mahmoud's asking another one. Can I upload my son's passport later? Not within 60 days after the ITA because we have only birth certificate for him from Australia and we're not able to get the passport from home country because of travel restrictions. The one answer I will give that applies to everything within express entry. This is that answer. You have an obligation to provide exactly what immigration has asked for when you submit your EAPR. Full stop. Now, there was a time during the pandemic when those things were okay. But right now, you have an obligation to provide exactly what they're asking for. And if you do not do that, you run the risk. Now, it may be a small risk. It may be a large risk. But you run the risk that an overzealous officer or an officer that's just not kind, it doesn't accept that. And they say, well, you haven't provided a, a birth, you haven't provided a passport for your son, so therefore, we're not going to allow your application to go forward. Now, that would be cruel. And I think if you provide a lot of evidence, including that you have actually applied for the passport, well, then in those circumstances, um, I think you're going to increase your chances that an officer might cut you some slack. But you need to really do a good job of explaining and hope that you get the right officer. Because without that passport, they are within their right to return your application as being complete, which, you put you, which will put you right back into the pool. So yeah, Mahmoud, um, 
I deal with these issues all the time with my clients and I, I make them do everything in their power to get the document. I never, ever, ever submit letters of explanation in lieu of documents. Um, just never. In 2015, I was burned not once, but twice by immigration where I attended an immigration conference, the Canadian Bar Association's National Immigration Conference, which is awesome. It's the preeminent conference. Um, that that conference I not only attended, but I spoke on a panel on express entry and the officers told us, don't worry, the officers are reasonable. If you don't have a document, provide a good explanation and, and it's not going to be a problem. Well, it was. They refused the application. And after getting burned not once but twice in early 2015 when Express Entry was created, never again did I allow a client to go forward without having everything. So there's the short answer there. Um, okay, so uh, Lalith, you're asking if 474 is good enough. I don't know if you're inside, outside Canada. If you're inside Canada and it's a CEC draw, of course. I suspect if you're talking about an open draw, no program spec uh, specific, um, 474, I think it will eventually come down to that level. But initially, I think the first scores are going to be over 480. And I think you guys have listened to me talk about this in the past. But if you go back and you go to the previous rounds of, oh, actually, no, let's go back here and let's just take a look at who's left in the pool. So this was before the last draw where only 3,000, remember, only 3,000 of these people were pulled out of the express entry pool. No. Let me stand corrected, okay? As of August the 30th, only the PNPs were drawn out. And the PNPs, there were only 635. So only 635 of these total candidates were pulled out. That means that there are, and you can see here, if we go 491 to 500, if you go 601, even 500 to 600, you can see there, there are over 3,000 people that are over 500. Now, some of them are PNP, and yes, some of them would have been drawn, um, but generally speaking, if it was a PNP, they would have captured um, only 635 of these were, were basically PNPs. Well, I should say right at this level. Even then, if you look at this, 540, the, the, the lowest ranking of candidates invited was 467. So realistically, this 540, there's going to be people that are up higher, so even fewer. So what I'm saying here is that you've got all of these people, which is probably almost in, in and of itself, there's you know over 2,500. Then you have here from 491 to 500, you have another 1,500. And then 481 to 490, there's over 4,000. So you can do the math. Four, you've got 557, uh, 70, well, almost 8,000, right? So it's pretty easy to see that with a score, the scores are going to be over 480 when they do at least a number of, of draws. There'll probably be a couple of draws because I don't anticipate them doing big, massive ones. So that's something to take into consideration. And so eventually, I think, if they continue to do multiple draws, it should settle back down. Um, but, uh, but initially, it'll be tough even at 474. Okay. Um, Okay, we've got other people that are overlapping. You know, how long is it taking with CC inland? Um, okay, this is a question that a lot of people are asking too. So Roden says, I'm eligible for FSW even if I'm still on a student visa in Canada, provided I have a CRS of 471. Well, Roden, depends on where your work history is. Do you have the three years of foreign work experience? If you do, there's nothing stopping you from applying. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. So, okay, let's see. It looks to me like I have a super chat from Abhishek here. And uh, let me just flip down here and we'll ask Abhishek. Okay, so he says, I've applied for TR to PR on 6th of... Oh, Abhishek, you're trying to... <laughs> Abhishek, okay. He says, I've applied for TR to PR on the 6th of May between 2 to 3 p.m. Not even received application number. Help me. Abhishek, <laughs> if I ring the bell, the reality is they are taking a long time to process these. Why are they taking a long time to process these? You're in the queue and you've got a lot going for you, my friend. So let me talk about this holistically. And it's a little bit out of there, but you submitted a super chat. So I'll answer your question. So the, the reality is individuals that have, um, uh, that have applied through the tier to peer pathway are in a different situation than express entry. Immigration is not refusing for simple little frivolous reasons. 
They are reaching out to candidates. They're requesting additional documents. They're requesting updated forms, corrections, things that are missed. And any time officers do that, it drags everything out with processing. So the initial applications that went through, some of them went through quick, but once the officers had a backlog and they started dealing with the applications that were deficient and had problems, it has caused everything Abishek to fall behind. And the difference between the tier to PR pathway and express entry is that for express entry, if something is missing, they just return the whole application and move quickly on to the next person. But that doesn't exist with the TR to PR pathway because R10, the completeness check and the ability to refuse, it doesn't exist with TR to PR pathway. So all the, although you, my friend right here, um, are getting frustrated because you want to see your application being processed and yes, between two to three was a little bit later in the day, the reality is you're going to have a very, very good chance of getting your application through, even if you rushed and even if you missed something. So they're going to give you a second shot at it. But for those express entry candidates, that is why I created the express entry complete step-by-step -step guide. That's why in addition to those over 50, whatever, 60 lessons, I can't remember how many there are, that's why in addition to those, I've added the, the master class with one hour live Q&As every single day next week at 5 p.m. where I help to ensure people don't make those simple little mistakes that really cost people their chance in many cases of immigrating to Canada. And I think you guys are very well aware, and I've had this discussion on numerous occasions with people, that the... Um, that when individuals are applying through express entry, they don't have the luxury of making mistakes. They can't take chances. They can't base their decision making on, well, it's more likely than not an officer will accept it. Any representative that you guys have that is telling you that, well, most of the applications, it's very rare that someone would get refused because of whatever they're telling you to do. Don't trust them. <laughs> Kick them loose because I as an immigration lawyer, deal in possibilities, not probabilities. Okay, we're gonna go 10 more minutes here and then I'm gonna wrap this sucker up um, at 8.30. It'll be an hour and a half, which is a little bit longer, but that's okay. Remember, click on the link below, go right here. You can watch the video that I did um, explaining about the course um, and then just click here and register. What is the cost? Well, you can see the cost is $347 US, but Trust me, it is worth every penny. And if you have doubts, or you're not sure, well, just scroll down to the bottom and look at all the candidates who took the course back in, I guess the last one was June, and see all the responses. We have immigration consultants like Shelly here. Um, George was on just tonight. Uh, Diane is also an immigration consultant. And so I teach the representatives. And if you want to get the insider knowledge that that is going to help you to avoid those most common pitfalls, this is how you do it. Okay, let's jump back here and let's get to some other questions. And obviously time will run out and I won't be able to get to everyone's. But always remember that you can book a consult with myself, Alicia, Susan, and we can help you in a 25-minute consult. We can deal with all of the, the doubts that you have. All right. Okay, let's see what's next here. Um... Ba, 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 ba. Let's see where we're at. Um, okay, Norin, great. This is a good one. I love this. I'm going to give you an applause here. So are there changes? Well, the Conservative Party says they'll add a premium fees option to express entry so to accelerate the applications program if they get elected. When do we expect it? <laughs> okay, so that's, a, that's something they've said in their policy. But I can tell you, that when they're rolling out uh, the promises in election platforms, often they make a lot of promises and it's a whole different world trying to actually implement it because there are regulatory changes, things that need to go through the, um, you know, all kinds of, of vetting and all of the departments before they ever become a reality. So none of you guys watching this video are likely going to ever be impacted by anything such as this that's been made in a campaign promise right now. Now it's possible, maybe next year, um, but at this stage, it's not something that's imminent. But that's great, Norn, that's a great point. I love the fact that you're watching it and you're you're looking to their platforms and you're reading what they say about immigration. Okay, um, let's see what else we have here. I'm gonna try to whip through a bunch really quick if I can. Um, 
Can we apply for PR in two different programs at the same time? Yep, you can do TR to PR and you can do express entry. There's no problems with that. Um, okay, Gloria, you got to click on the link. I recommend you book um, your, your spot in the express entry course and you can learn everything you need to know about how to immigrate regardless of which country you're coming from through express entry. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. And yeah, I think I've answered this one about FSW and processing. Um, it's just it's just slow, you guys. In some countries, it's it's not happening at all, um, but it's just slow. Okay, um, and then people asking about, hey, AOR, January 2021, any chance to be completed before January? Um, anything that's FSW, it's very unlikely that it's going to be completed this year. CEC, I'd say yes, but um, it's very, very like strong likelihood that yes, you would need to redo your medical. Very strong likely, likelihood. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, okay, and I'm going to focus on express entry here. Yeah, so if it's not related, like if I know one person asking about a nanny there, that's outside of express entry. Um, okay, Sam says if someone's on an IEC working holiday and has worked one year at a company, can they use that job to claim a job offer for their EE profile? It's unlikely that that would be successful because you have to have the ability to um, to continue working, and the the job offer requires that you uh, that you maintain your ability to work in Canada. Now it's interesting because Sam IECs would fall under Category Three for job offers. So if you worked for one full year and the company with the company in Canada, um, those are usually designed for people who maintain their work status. But that is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one of these, man, because that's a very, very good question. Um, so what I don't know from what you've explained here is whether or not they are, they've got a way to continue working. Did they apply for an LMIA after that? Was there another mechanism or an extension available? And so there's no restrictions if it's an, if it's a working holiday, and this is the key here. If it's a working holiday visa, those tend to be open work permits. And um, I'll backtrack a little bit as I really digest your question. There are a number of different things. There's young professionals. There are other employer-specific named employer work permits. Those are all eligible potentially for the one year um, for the job offer. But for the working holiday that's an open work permit, no, you can't claim that uh, for, for points for job offer. I had to just dissect that a little bit more carefully. Um Okay, Anil says, hey, is it possible for my employer, to, if my employer is providing a not code on my experience letter for CEC, is it okay? Yeah, no problems at all. Um, not a problem at all. Of course, you can put the not code. It's just one more indication that, hey, officer, um, uh, we think it's really this not code. Okay, if tech says, how do gift deeds work? I'm depositing money in my bank, but I'm afraid it will take a few more months to reach settlement amount. In this case, can I get a gift deed of the total amount from parents? Guess where you can learn more about that if tech? It's in the actual section that's all about proof of funds, video instructions, uh, sample gift deeds. Everything are all in there and available for you guys. I recommend that you that you purchase a subscription to the course and join it. We can go through this in detail. But in essence, gift deeds are essentially money that's given usually by family. I don't like trying to put a gift deed in from a friend because friends don't give money; they loan money. Family is more likely to be accepted as giving money. And then when it comes to that gift deed, it just has to be an irrevocable gift. It has to be um, done in some form of a, a deed or a legal process that says, yes, I'm giving this money. It's not a loan. It's for love and affection because I, I really like if tech is a, you know, he's a good son and I'm going to give it to him for the purposes of settling in Canada. And, uh, and that gift deed then um, is accepted by immigration. It is if it's done properly. Okay, and a lot of things, express entry, it can be pretty straightforward if you do things correctly. When it's done correctly, like your letters of explanation when they're done correctly, your chances of approval go up dramatically. When your reference letters are, 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 are done correctly, when you've chosen your knock code properly and represented it to the officer, um, when you have done your proof of funds and your, your bank letters are correct. And, and if there's something deficient, you've, you've followed some telltale little steps that I have in my course that are designed to shore up or strengthen any deficiencies in bank letters. We haven't even had any questions about settlement funds at this stage, largely because so many people are CEC and don't need them. Once it opens up again, then I'm going to see a lot more questions about 
um, about settlement funds. Okay, so the question now, as I'm going through this, the question is, who is going to be the winner? So here are the two choices that we have to join me. And I don't know if you're even on here. So we've got Iman who says, could you do a live on effective election on immigration? That was actually a really good question and a really good suggestion. And I love those just as much. And then the other question that I had highlighted uh, was this one here from Dran Reb, which says, how long should my reference letter I get to my previous company prior to uploading post ITA? How old should it be? So I'm going to extend an invitation to both Dran Reb and to Iman to join me um, right now to say hello to everybody. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to post for you guys right here. I'm going to put it up here. I'm going to take the link and I'm going to post it right on my screen. And only those two are going to be invited on. Uh, so if you request to join and you're not Dan Reb or Iman, and I, I've got room for both of you guys, then I'm not going to invite you in. So you'll be sitting trying to dial in and I will cancel and reject you. <laughs> so this is this is the fun part of this EE Live Q&A that I used to do a lot of before. And uh, and I am excited to have the opportunity to do it again. I just now need to pull up my, um, my window for overlays and then go in here and pull up the text. And this is a long one, but I think I can get it in here. Oh, that's not very good. Let's close that and let's try this again. Uh, I'm going to post the link and all you guys have to do is click on this link and then it will, um, let me just shrink this down. Why does it have to be so big? There it is. I think you guys can see this. So here's the link right here. And I think you guys can see it. Let's see where we can put it here. We'll make it bigger so everybody can see. Okay. There's the link. Okay. So all you have to do is type this into your URL. If you have a video, so you need your video so we can see you. Um, and you are either, <laughs> we have our we have our two winners. We've got Iman here, right there with this question. And then we have, uh, let's see if I can also pull in the question for uh, Dran Reb here. Uh, I'm not sure if I can pull two in on the same time. Oh yeah, I can, right there. So there's our two winners. There's the two winning questions. So if you guys want to join, all you have to do is just click on the, um, well, you can't click on the link, but type in that link. I think you guys should be able to see it clear enough. And then I'll I'll let you come in and join me. Okay, so there's the two winners. All right, while we're waiting for them, I will go into bonus time. Okay, so bonus time. And let's get to a few more questions here uh, before we wrap things up. Okay. Yes. Okay, Nirmala is making a comment, not a question. Outdated website with outdated processing system. It's a disaster. It's horrible. I agree. Okay, let's see what else we have. Um, yes, CC applications with dependents are definitely taking more time. Let's see what else we have here. Um, I don't know. Iman, are you going to join us or, or what do you think here? If you guys don't want to join us, if you don't want to join me live, just, just post a comment and I'll watch for it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we got here. Um, uh, let's see, Him Himanshu, hey, my friend. Let's see what Himanshu says. If you have Mark's DIY guide, you don't need help from any consultant. Subscribe to it and save a lot of money. Himanshu actually purchased the course and um, and he has no invested interest and I didn't tell him to post that. Uh, so you guys can decide what you want. Himanshu, are you even on here? Maybe you are, I can't remember, my friend, if you if, if I still have your, your comment on here. Maybe you do, maybe you are. I had, to, like, I. oh, there you are. Yeah, you're still there, my friend. Kudos to Mark and his team for the concept masterclass. It's like one hour, one-to-one -one consultation daily for two weeks. Yes, and that was, that was, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, thank you, my friend, for that positive comment. Okay, I don't think they're joining us. I think maybe they're just not in a position to do it. <laughs> okay, so Iman's shutting me down, and maybe um, maybe Dren Reb is not around, and that's totally fine. Okay, let's, let's go with a few more questions. We'll get rid of this, and uh, let's see here. Um... Processing time, Sajad for CEC is all over the map. I, I We just had a candidate get theirs in less than three months. So we had one person um, uh, just get, yeah, literally get their approval in less than three months. But that is extremely rare. Okay, um, let's see what else we have here. Um, 
Let's see. Both of them part time. Okay, this is a great one, Mariana. And once again, we dissect this in detail in the course. So she says, "Can you meet the one year experience with both full time and part time experience? Are hourly pay stubs needed for irregular hours?" So when it comes to the question you have here, it depends on your CEC or whether you're FSW. If you're outside of Canada, it has to all be continuous, okay? Yes, you can have some periods that are full-time and some periods that are part-time, but it has to be all continuous. And remember, your part-time is like only half credit towards the the, the full-time one year. But you have to meet that one year continuous. Oh, let's see. I can't tell who's joining here. I can't tell if this is um, if this is Dran Reb. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you tell me. I've got you. I, I've got you dialing in here. Uh, it says H Man, but I don't know if that's you. So if that's Dran Reb, um, you let me know if that's you or whoever it is, and I I may just let you in. But if not, I'm not gonna let the person in. Okay. So Marianne, in the course, I have something called my. Um, well, let me just show you. So in the course, we have a tool as well. We've got lots of tools to help people. Um, but if we go right in, let's go in here in my library. And then I'm going to go right into the courses. And if I go down to this one and I go to the work, ex, the work, ex, the records of employment section, this is, like I said, this is one of the ones that we put so much effort into. We've got a ton of tools and resources. You can see I have an FSW hours of work calculator and the CEC hours of work tool. And both of those tools are designed to help you determine um, if you have actually achieved the 1560 hours that you need. So you have to check those out. Okay, let's see here. Um, let's see, what is next? We'll wrap this up. Two more and then we'll figure it out here. Okay, uh, let's see. Moni says, as a subscriber to the TR to PR course, special engine course would be well worth it. All your questions will be answered and you'll be 100% prepared. Thank you so much. I'm really glad, um, Moni, that you, that you really benefited from the TR to PR course. That was a crazy whirlwind course. And I absolutely love doing it. And that's the express entry course was what prepared me to do the TR to PR pathway when it opened up. And so many people were able to benefit from it. I was so, so happy. And um, yeah, $347 is what it costs. Okay. um, Let's see. Okay. I think guys, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Let's see. Faith Oze says, not a question, but thank you so much for these sessions. You're the best. And if anyone think of buying the course, it is 100% worth it. Just do it. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Um, let's see here if there's anything else. We'll wrap this up. Um, oh, okay. I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up here. Okay. And we'll, we'll wrap it up with Tarek here. So thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. I'm just going to start that sound effects up. And that means we're going to wrap this up for today. Um, those of you who are wondering, how do I subscribe to the course? It's in the link below. All you have to do is go to the Canadian Immigration Institute. And when you're there, um, you will be able to have access to the login information, a whole bunch of other information. I'll just click on here and show you. If you search Canadian Immigration Institute, you'll get right to this page where you can see the courses. What do we have? The tr to pr is obviously 50% off because it's wrapping up. And then the express entry goes live on Monday, September the 13th. You can get the course here. Hey, if some of you are just hanging around and you're thinking about listing your spouse as non-accompanying so you can come and then sponsor after, get notified right here about the spousal course that's coming. And many people have been purchasing the LMIA course as well as the PR card renewal course that we are in the process of rolling out. So those are some of the things that are coming. And I would love to have you guys join us in the upcoming express entry step-by-step course and masterclass with yours truly, Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer. It's been awesome. I love doing these live Q and A's and uh, I'm, I'm so grateful people like Kaushik here. He says he helped me a lot with these Q and A's. I'm so, so grateful. And, uh, oh, he said, I got my CECPR. Woo! That is awesome. I'm just going to stop the music and clap. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in and we will see you on Wednesday. If not, I might just jump on tomorrow and do another one. We'll just see how the time goes. But I'll see you on Wednesday. Subscribe to the course. It'll be worth it. You will not regret it. Okay, take care. See you guys later.